Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the eBay Q4 2019 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Joe Belante, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to eBay's earnings release conference call for the fourth quarter of 2019. Joining me today in the call are Scott Schenkel, our Interim Chief Executive Officer, and Andy Kring, our Interim Chief Financial Officer. We're providing a slide presentation to accompany Andy's commentary during the call, which is available through our, the Investor Relations section of the eBay website at investors.ebayinc.com. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that during the course of this conference call, we will discuss some non-GAAP measures related to our performance. You can find the reconciliation of these measures to the nearest comparable GAAP measures in the slide presentation accompanying this conference call. Additionally, all revenue and GMV growth rates mentioned in Scott and Andy's remarks represent FX neutral year-over-year -year comparisons, unless they indicate otherwise. In this conference call, management will make forward-looking statements including, without limitation, statements regarding our future performance and expected financial results. These forward-looking statements involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties, and our actual results may differ materially from our forecast for a variety of reasons. You can find more information about risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could affect our operating results in our most recent periodic reports on Form 10-K and Form 10-Q and our earnings release from earlier today. You should not rely on any forward-looking statements. All information in this presentation is as of January 28, 2020, and we do not intend and undertake no duty to update this information. With that, let me turn the call over to Scott. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As I mentioned last quarter, our focus was to deliver our Q4 and full year commitments, execute on our growth initiatives of managed payments and advertising, improve the buyer experience and seller capabilities, and make progress on our portfolio and operational reviews. For 20 and beyond, we would assess how to deliver. For our buyers and sellers, we're ensuring our focus. We focus investments to serve our customers and shareholders. Let me walk you through each of these in more detail. Specific to our Q4 commitments, volume was in line with our expectations, down 4%, while organic revenue was at the high end of our guide, up 1%. Margin was strong at over 29%, inclusive of our ongoing investment in managed payments. Non-GAAP EPS was $0.81, cents, up 15%, substantially better than expected. In addition, we reached a deal to sell StubHub to Viagogo for $4.05 billion, while following a discipline process that led to a favorable valuation. For the full year 2019, GMV was down 2%, while organic revenue growth was 3%, at the high end of our January outlook. Non-GAAP earnings per share grew double digits each quarter, and was above our guidance. And we drove strong productivity, allowing us to reinvest into managed payments while delivering one point of margin accretion. Additionally, as part of our operating review, we announced plans to further reduce expenses to reinvest in growth initiatives and improve profitability. The net of these actions is expected to yield at least two points of margin accretion over the next three years. Finally, we returned $5.5 billion to shareholders through share buybacks and our first ever dividend. Since separating from PayPal, we have repurchased approximately 35% of shares outstanding net of dilution. For the year, GMV declined primarily due to two headwinds. First, we indicated that we would reduce marketing that was not activating buyers with high lifetime values. While reducing near-term GMV and buyer growth, this also drive a, drove a higher take rate and better profitability. The second was the implementation by U.S. states of internet sales tax. This rollout happened faster than anticipated and affected small businesses and consumer sellers, requiring marketplaces to collect and remit on their behalf. We expect this headwind to continue until we lap a fully rolled out U.S. internet sales tax landscape. We remain hopeful and are advocating 
that the U.S. will take a national approach to simplify compliance requirements and reduce the burden on small businesses. While dealing with those volume headwinds, organic revenue grew five points faster than GMV, much of which came from our growth initiatives, managed payments, and advertising. Regarding managed payments, we continue to make great progress on our journey to transform our ecosystem. Since, since launch, we have processed more than $2 billion of GMV for almost 25,000 sellers on our payment rails. While our pricing has been discounted to, record, to reward early participation, to date, sellers have saved almost $10 million in fees, and they have more options on how and when they get paid. As we exited the year, our U.S. volume approached the limit permitted under the operating agreement, while in Germany we ramped from 0 to 3 percent, faster than our U.S. ramp. We remain confident in realizing an incremental $2 billion in revenue and half a billion dollars of operating income in 2022. Advertising continues to drive revenue growth. In Q4, promoted listings delivered $136 million of revenue, up 75 percent. Over 1.1 million sellers promoted more than 320 million listings in the quarter. For the year, promoted listings revenue doubled and helped us reach our plan of more than $700 million in total advertising. While we have started to lap significant acceleration from a year ago, we still expect double-digit advertising revenue growth going forward. This performance was supported by deeper integration into listing flows and the seller hub, which increased adoption. In addition, ad conversion was up due to improved algorithms, which utilize structured data to enhance search ranking. We remain on track with our plan to build a $1 billion advertising business. Over the course of 2019, we improved the buyer experience by increasing the collection and use of structured data. We collected more aspect data from sellers in fashion and home categories by making it easier to see what buyers were searching for in the listings flows and the seller tools. When sellers uploaded that data, these structured data and rich listings make search better and convert faster. This additional data contributed to improved merchandising algorithms and promoted listing relevance in search. We also improved our seller hub over the course of the year. In addition to the TerraPeak integration, one feature we launched was seller-initiated offers, where a seller can engage individual buyers with better deals. This feature has grown to over 1 million offers per day with pricing options and an easy-to-use automated experience. We are pleased that we delivered on our 2019 commitments. As we enter 2020, our priorities are clear. We will continue to drive revenue through our growth initiatives, deliver more seller tools, improve the buyer experience by leveraging our structured data foundation while driving more margin expansion. Managed payments will reach an important milestone in July when our operating agreement expires and we will be ready to scale to rapidly scale additional countries and corridors while delivering a better customer experience. For advertising, we will provide sellers more tools to optimize their ad spend. We expect, we expect this will increase conversion and improve pricing without adversely impacting the buyer experience. For sellers, we will expand insights and data in the seller hub while improving our guidance capabilities. We will also remove friction from the consumer selling experience, particularly on mobile. For buyers, we will build better vertical capabilities that will start in a few categories and scale across the platform. With features such as payments for high dollar items with escrow and clear item condition definitions. We will also focus on improving buyer trust through increased shipment tracking in our international markets. All of, these experience will level, all of these experiences will leverage aspect data, which will lead to benefits in search recall, ranking, and relevance. We also plan to collect more data in electronics, fashion, and home and garden to increase the overall aspect data population. While delivering on these better experiences for customers, we will drive further margin expansion by simplifying our structure, controlling costs, and reducing ineffective marketing spend. For buyer-focused marketing, we will rebalance spending between acquisition, retention, and frequency. Finally, there are two topics I would like to proactively address. First, regarding the portfolio, our primary objective is to maximize shareholder value. We evaluate each business in our portfolio for long-term synergies and value creation opportunities. 
When we take action, like with StubHub, we utilize a consistent set of guiding principles, including value to eBay shareholders, speed of execution, certainty to close, and operational simplicity. Our board and leadership team continue to operate with these guiding principles, and we anticipate having an update to share about our classifieds business by the middle of this year. We appreciate that our employees continue to maintain focus in a time of uncertainty about what the future structure of classifieds might be, while everyone is excited about the opportunities it could bring. Second, regarding the CEO search, the board is actively conducting a process with the support of a search firm and is considering internal and external candidates. In the interim, the leadership team has the full support of the board and we continue to make changes to better serve our customers, employees, and shareholders. Over the past few months, we have reprioritized our product roadmap, reallocated marketing investments, and simplified our structure. By elevating our largest on-platform marketplaces regions and global marketing organization to the executive leadership team, we are increasing focus on the marketplace business, which is where we see the biggest value creation opportunity. Our top 2020 priorities remain clear, deliver our growth initiatives, provide more seller tools, improve buyer experiences, leverage our structured data foundation, all while delivering margin expansion. We believe these changes will result in a better balance of sustainable, of sustainable growth and profitability that maximizes long-term shareholder value. Our teams are excited about the challenge and look forward to delivering on these commitments. Now let me turn it over to Andy to provide more details on our financial performance. Mr. Crane? Thank you, Scott. I will begin my prepared remarks with our Q4 financial highlights starting on slide four of the earnings presentation. In Q4, we generated $2.8 billion of revenue, 81 cents of non-GAAP BPS, and $672 million of free cash flow, while returning $1.1 billion to shareholders through share repurchases and cash dividends. Moving to active buyers on slide five, we have 183 million active buyers, representing 2% year-on-year growth. This is a two-point deceleration from Q3, driven in part by reduced marketing spend that was driving growth in buyers with lower engagement and a higher churn than we expected. Moving to slide six, in Q4, we enabled $23.3 billion of GMV, down 4%, decelerating two points versus the prior quarter. In the U.S., we generated $8.9 billion, down 8%, while we delivered $14.4 billion internationally, down 1%. Moving to revenue on slide seven, we generated net revenues of $2.8 billion, up 1% organically. We delivered $2.3 billion of transaction revenue, up 1%, and $539 million of marketing services and other revenue, down 5%, inclusive of a seven-point headwind from the sale of Brands for Friends. Turning to slide eight, our marketplace platform GMV was down 4% in Q4, decelerating two points versus the prior quarter. U.S. GMV was down 9% driven by a six-point impact from internet sales tax and four points from the continued reduction and redistribution of marketing spend. The impact of internet sales tax in Q4 was three points worse than Q3, as 11 more states, including California and Texas, went live in October. International GMV was down 1%, decelerating two points versus Q3, primarily driven by lower consumer confidence in the UK from uncertainty surrounding Brexit and a reduced on-platform marketing spend. Total marketplaces revenue was $2.2 billion, down 1%, decelerating two points from the prior quarter. Transaction revenue grew 1%, a three-point deceleration. The gap between revenue and GMV growth continues. The five-point gap in Q4 was driven by three factors. Over three points from promoted listings, nearly one point from category mix effects, and nearly another point from the continued growth in managed payments. Looking forward, we expect a contribution of payments revenue to significantly increase in the second half of 2020, leading to revenue growth remaining at higher levels than GMV growth until fully scaled. Marketing services and other revenue was down 17%, 
decelerating four points versus Q3. The year-on-year -year decline is driven by 13 points from the sale of Brands for Friends and the continued reduction of third-party ads. Marketplace segment margin was 32%, up nearly one point year-on-year, -year, primarily due to reduced marketing and continued cost leverage, partially offset by our investment and managed payments. For the full year, the marketplace platform generated $85.5 billion of GMV, down 2%, and $8.6 billion of revenue, up 2%. Turning to slide nine, StubHub GMV was down 5%, decelerating five points from Q3, mostly from the weak event landscapes, landscape and concerts and theater. StubHub revenue grew 2% year on year versus 5% in Q3. Transaction revenue was down 2%, a two point deceleration driven by volume, partially offset by a higher take rate from pricing changes and event mix. MSNO has more than tripled year on year for the fourth straight quarter, delivering $16 million of revenue in Q4. Most of StubHub's MSNO revenue is first party sales, which represents, which provides buyers access to unique and exclusive inventory and insurance for purchase tickets. StubHub segment margin was 22% down nearly four points, primarily driven by investments in our first party business and consulting costs, partially offset by lower marketing spend. For the full year, StubHub delivered $4.7 billion of GMV, down 1%, and $1.1 billion in revenue, growing 4%. Moving to slide 10, in Q4, Classified's revenue grew 6%, decelerating two points. Our German businesses continued strong double-digit growth, driven by our market-leading horizontal, eBay Kleinenzagen, and our vertical motors platform, Mobile. In addition, we are delivering strong growth in verticals across the portfolio. The quarter-on-quarter -quarter deceleration is primarily driven by continued headwinds in horizontal display advertising across our markets outside of Germany. Segment margin for classifieds was 43%, down one point year on year. For the full year, Classifieds generated nearly $1.1 billion of revenue, up 9% versus the prior year. Turning to slide 11 and major cost drivers. In Q4, we delivered non-GAAP operating margin of 29.3%. This is up 10 basis points year on year, inclusive of a full point of investment and managed payments, an additional pressure from the growth in our first party inventory programs in Korea and StubHub, more than offset by reductions in marketing and the divestiture of Brands for Friends. Cost of revenue is up 160 basis points year on year as a percentage of revenue, driven by scaling managed payments in our first party inventory programs, partially offset by the divestiture of Brands for Friends. Q4 sales and marketing expense was down over three points versus the prior year, primarily driven by a double-digit reduction in marketing and promotional spend in our marketplace on-platform business, while increasing year-over-year -year investments in our marketplace off-platform businesses. Product development costs were up 70 basis points from investments in managed payments and in classifieds to expand our vertical offering. G&A was up one point mostly driven by portfolio and operating review costs and our continued investment in managed payments. For the year, operating margin was 28.2%, up one point and in line with our original 2019 full year guidance. Turning to EPS on slide 12, in Q4, we delivered 81 cents of non-GAAP EPS, up 15% versus the prior year, our seventh consecutive quarter of double-digit non-GAAP EPS expansion. The non-GAAP EPS growth was driven primarily by our share repurchase program, a lower tax rate, and operating efficiencies, partially offset by FX and our investment in managed payments. Favorability versus our guidance in October was mostly driven by continued cost control and an in-period tax benefit. For the year, we delivered 22% growth in non-GAAP EPS, 
primarily driven by our share repurchase program and expanding operating leverage. GAAP EPS for the quarter was $0.69, cents, down 14% versus last year. The decrease in GAAP EPS is mostly driven by a higher tax rate as we lap a 2018 deferred tax adjustment, partially offset by gains associated with the Audion warrant and share repurchases. As always, you can find the detailed reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial me measures in our press release and earnings presentation. Moving to slide 13, in Q4, we generated $672 million of free cash flow, down 39%, mostly driven by a timing of both working capital and cash taxes. We had another strong year of cash generation, finishing 2019 with nearly $2.6 billion of free cash flow, a 27% increase year on year, driven by lower cash taxes, improved working capital, and lower capital expenditures. Moving to slide 14, our capital allocation strategy and key tenants and targets have not changed. For the quarter, we ended with cash and investments of $3.8 billion and debt of $7.8 billion. In Q4, we repurchased nearly 28 million shares at an average price of $36.19 per share, amounting to $1 billion. We ended the year with $2.2 billion of share repurchase authorization remaining. Turning to slide 15, in July, we shared progress on our capital allocation plan for 2019. Looking at that same view today, we have delivered against all the markers we set out for the year. We initiated and executed our first ever dividend. We completed $5 billion in share repurchases we ended the year with cash of $3.8 billion, above our year-end target of $3.5 billion, driven by our overperformance on free cash flow. And we maintained our triple B rating while delivering on our stated ratio targets of 1.5 times net debt and below three times gross debt to EBITDA. Moving to full year guidance on slide 16, the 2020 guidance we are providing assumes our current portfolio, including StubHub, is in place for the entire year. We will provide updates as appropriate moving forward. I also want to provide a little more context on the impact of internet sales tax. Throughout 2019, as states implemented marketplace responsibility to collect sales tax, our sellers and our volume were negatively impacted. In each state, we saw an immediate drop in volume followed by relatively stable growth rates in the months that followed. We expect growth to recover as we lap the launch dates in affected states. And early data from the states that launched in January of 2019 shows that recovery. Given these dynamics, we expect the negative impact of internet sales tax to be modestly larger in the first half with more states launching, and then start to taper off in the second half as we lap quarters where a larger number of states went live in 2019. Please refer to the appendix of the earnings deck for additional details on the impact of internet sales tax on our U.S. marketplace business throughout 2019, including the timing of when states launched. With that as background, we are projecting 2020 revenue between $10.72 and $10.92 billion, growing one to 3% on an organic FX neutral basis, and minus one to plus 1% on an as reported basis. We anticipate two points of growth to come from the continued ramp of managed payments, and one point from advertising, which we expect to be approximately $800 million in 2020. Underlying this guidance, we expect marketplace year-over-year -year volume to decline low single digits, consistent with our 2019 performance as an incremental point of internet sales tax pressure will be offset with improvements in conversion. We expect StubHub to deliver low single digit revenue growth and in classifieds we expect similar top line growth to 2019. We anticipate the stronger US dollar and the disposition of brands for friends to negatively impact 2020 revenue by approximately $200 million compared to 2019. We plan to deliver additional operating margin expansion 
while we invest in the long-term growth of our business. We expect margin of 28.5 to 29.5% for the year, which at the midpoint represents an increase of 80 basis points versus 2019. This margin expansion will be driven, driven by continued marketing optimization, focused product and technology investments, best-in-class corporate functional costs, and more effective procurement, partially offset by approximately one point from our investment in managed payments and currency headwinds. We expect non-GAAP effective tax rate in the range of 15.5 to 17.5%. With regards to capital allocation, our guidance implies approximately $1.5 billion of share repurchases in 2020, inclusive of dilution offset. In January, our board approved a 14% increase to our quarterly dividend, raising it to 16 cents per share. The dividend will be payable to shareholders of record as of March 2nd, with a payment date of March 20th. Our board has also approved an additional share repurchase authorization of $5 billion with no expiration. We have not made any assumptions in this guidance for the use of StubHub proceeds. Should the deal close in Q1 as anticipated, you can expect that we will deploy that cash in a manner consistent with our capital allocation tenants. We are projecting non-GAAP EPS of 2.95 to $3.05 per share, up 4 to 8%. This includes the impact of modest top-line growth, additional margin leverage, and the ongoing benefit of our share repurchase program. Growth is partially offset by our investment in managed payments and approximately seven points from the combination of a stronger U.S. dollar, less interest income based on lower cash balances, and a higher tax rate as certain benefits impacting 2019 won't repeat. We expect free cash flow of $2.2 to $2.4 billion, which assumes capital expenditures in the range of 4 to 6%. Full-year GAAP EPS is projected to be $2.18 to $2.28 per share. Turning to slide 17, for Q1, we are projecting revenue between 2.55 and $2.60 billion, growing minus one to plus 1% on an organic FX neutral basis. It's important to note that given the second half ramp of managed payments following the end of the operating agreement and the lapping of the internet sales tax headwind, that we expect our second half performance will reflect higher growth rates for volume and revenue compared to the first half. We expect non-GAAP EPS of 70 to 73 cents per share, representing four to 9% growth. EPS growth is driven primarily by the combined effect benefit of lower share count and operational growth, partially offset by investments in managed payments. In addition, there are four points of headwinds from the combination of a stronger U.S. dollar and less interest income based on lower cash balances, partially offset by a lower non-GAAP tax rate. We are expecting GAAP EPS in the range of 50 to 53 cents per share in Q1. In summary, while 2019 volume growth was challenged, we delivered on our financial commitments and our growth initiatives while laying a strong foundation for 2020 and beyond. We ramped managed payments according to plan and scaled better buyer and seller experiences, including launching in a second market. We delivered strong advertising revenue, including triple digits within promoted listings. In 2019, we delivered a point of margin expansion despite pressure from lower volume and our investment in managed payments. We executed a comprehensive operating review and are on track to deliver at least an additional two points of margin expansion over the next three years. We continue to return capital to shareholders, initiating our first ever dividend, and we repurchased $5 billion of our stock. We continue to make progress on our portfolio review, divesting brands for friends and reaching an agreement to sell StubHub at a favorable valuation. We've reorganized the leadership and operational teams to deliver better outcomes in our marketplace on-platform business, increasing focus on our customers and speed of decision-making. We entered 2020 focused on our top priorities, managed payments, advertising, 
providing more seller tools, improving buyer experiences, and leveraging our structured data foundation. As we navigate through a period of lower volume growth, our plan is to deliver continued revenue and earnings growth, margin expansion, and a consistent capital allocation strategy to maximize shareholder value. And now we'd be happy to answer your questions. Operator? To ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. The first question comes from Heath Terry of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Um, thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you could give us just a uh, if you if you could just give us a sense, you know, of the the guidance as we look at 2020. Um, is there a um, is there a way to to kind of disaggregate the the impact both of um, the internet sales tax, which you guys have given us a lot of information on, which I, I you know I think we all appreciate, um, but some of your initiatives around focusing more on um, what you see as as being kind of the core um, eBay uh, revenue or the core eBay. Um, uh, businesses and, and sort of chasing what I, I think in, in the past you've kind of described as being less profitable um, revenue is, is you look to sort of focus more on um, on sort of the higher value or, or core eBay experience. Um, uh, is, is there a way to disaggregate sort of the impact that that's having on on guidance or the impact that that's having on on the growth that you're that you're guiding to um, for this year and then as we um, uh, as we think about sort of the the process around um, uh, around the classified side of the business you've in the past talked about sort of the complication of pursuing anything less than a um, a full sale of the the the, the asset um, and I was just wondering you know if, if you could give us a, a bit of an update on sort of your thoughts around um, uh, as as you've gotten further into this sort of what um, what would make sense uh, along those lines um, as well thank you sure Heath, um, it's Andy I'll start with um a couple of answers on guidance, and then I think Scott will, will kick in on the classified side. Uh, it, it's I think what I tried to point out in the script, and as you think about um, the volume guidance being relatively consistent uh, year to year in the low single digit for marketplaces, it, it'll have a very different dynamic half to half. The, the first half of the year with, with IST really at full ramp will look more like Q4 in the second half of the year will start to will start to accelerate a little bit uh, as we lap out of some of those states when when you elevate up and you look at that on a full year basis we go from about a little over a point of IST impact in 2019 to something a little over uh, a point of it or two points of impact in 2020 so an additional point of pressure from IST or two full points of negative volume pressure from IST in 20. So that, that's how to think about about that. And then on the less profitable revenue piece, you know, we continue to refine how we allocate the marketing spend. And I think similar to the IST dynamic, it, it won't be drastically different impact, 19 versus 20, where we feel like we'll have roughly a point of negative impact from continued refine, refining, continuing to refine how we allocate the marketing spend and eliminating um, some of the lower ROI spend. Yeah, uh, Heath, on, on the sale classifieds, look, it's a, as, as I think everyone understands, a great business and, and a wonderful space. We've got, you know, one of the leading, if not the leading asset uh, in the industry and uh, this is about shareholder value creation. So at, at this point, I would not exclude any option, um, although it's unlikely that we would pursue an option of, of, of divesting uh, uh, platform by platform, uh, which, which a lot of people have reached out on. That, that's not really in our, I think, our best interest or, or in line with maximizing shareholder value creation. But uh, it's completely doable, and uh, we're looking at all those options, and as I said, in fact, have an, impact, a, uh, an update uh, on that by mid-year. Great. Thank you both. Yep. 
Your next question is from Eric Sheridan of UBS. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you so much for taking the questions. Maybe two if I can on the marketing piece. Um, how far along are you on the marketing optimization against your goals of multiple years? Here you talk about continuing to reduce exposure to the lower ROI channels. Just want to get a better sense of like the linearity going forward through 20 and beyond of how you'll sort of accomplish those goals. And then with the growth headwinds you might be facing in the first half, as you characterize it as a two half type year in 2020, any thoughts around leaning into some of the paid marketing channels that are delivering for you and sort of having a first half, second half component to the marketing expenditures in 2020 or how we should think about that? Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, Eric, uh, this is Scott. I would uh, I'd characterize the 2020 marketing costs as coming down approximately in line with the same as we came down in 2019. And so we don't expect material headwinds and growth but uh, it will be reducing our underlying marketing spend. But within that, uh, for sure, uh, we'll be reallocating, as I mentioned, and that would include reallocating into a uh, paid search to help, uh, to help growth where we think uh, it makes the most sense and where the returns make sense as well. Next question. Your next question. Up comes from Colin Sebastian of BART. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I guess on the pricing experiments with sneakers, wondering what you're seeing there in terms of listing activity and what would determine if, if that's a model that, that could work in, in other categories out, outside of shoes. And then maybe as a follow-up um, on the marketing spend, but more specifically on the sequential plateauing of active buyers. Since I think in, in past quarters you guys have indicated that this is an important KPI uh, in terms of the health of the platform overall and potential future growth. Uh, are there any specific efforts geared at, at, at um, reaccelerating the number of active buyers? Thank you. Hey, first on uh, sneakers. Yeah, look, it's, a, it's an, interesting, uh, an interesting, interesting question and certainly interesting in terms of what we did in December. Um, you know, as you might know, our online marketplace has one of the widest and most uh, and most unique set of inventory of sneakers out there. And we have a history of experimenting with different types of selling promotions across different markets. Uh, and in this case, what we announced in December was a sneakers promotion that uh, was a continuation of that practice of experimentation. Um, it's, a, it's in two markets and in sneakers over $100. And so um, what we're looking for is really how does the monetization change? We, you know, as you think about, um, you know, no final value fees and sneakers over $100, but there's other dynamics at play here, including uh, first-party ads and, uh, and, and other dynamics where we're trying to look at conversion and accelerated active buyers in those categories. And so to date, uh, we've seen some added benefits, not only with uh, additional promoted listings, but also with uh, additional uh, listings by uh, by sellers, activity by buyers, and GMB. And so, uh, as we look at that and then consider what we're going to do with the product, it's uh, it gets pretty interesting from here. And you know, we'll see uh, where we go from here. But right now, it's a very small scale, but very interesting experiment. Yeah, I, I think the only thing I'd add to that, Scott, you know, to your point. It's one category in two markets, uh, but it's a way we can really highlight the breadth and depth of the inventory we have across across the, this competitive vertical. So feel good about that. And then active buyers. Yeah, look on active buyers. Couple a couple of thoughts. Uh, first off, active buyers is is always important. Um, we've indexed recently um, and, and overweighted on getting active buyers, uh, new active buyers into this ecosystem. And uh, that, as we've been highlighting over the course of uh, 2019, that's favored active uh, buyer growth, particularly with new and react, what we call new and reactivated buyers. Um, as we look into 2019 or 20, we'll continue investing in new buyers, but we're going to migrate some of that spend into getting those new buyers that we brought into the ecosystem over the next last four quarters and get them to try and buy more. And so it's going to be more about generating the GMV and the GMB from them um, while we look at and, and continue to explore ways to expand the GMB per buyer in our retained buyer base. 
which, by the way, in Q4 was very stable, which is, I think, great news. And as we pivot into next year, you can expect us to uh, look a little bit less towards bringing uh, a whole bunch of new buyers in, but making, you know, continuing some investments there, but expanding more into uh, converting those buyers that we brought in the last year and our retained buyer base as well. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Your next question is from Ross Sandler of Barclays. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, hey, guys. Just two questions. So uh, thanks for the detail on slide 20 on the IST. So are you basically saying that if we look at these four quarters that um, – the improvement that you've seen XIST is that just lapping the couponing initiatives, or are there other things that you're working on that are driving that that uptick from you know down six to only down three in, in recent quarters? And then as we look forward, your guidance assumes like a that the year starts kind of flat in 2020, and the back half is going to be up about four percent. So is that GMV growth picking up, or is that from payments kicking in in second half? Any color there on, on those two, uh, that would be great. Yeah, I, I think on the on the half versus half, it's it's both. It, it's certainly um, an improved, an increased uh, lift from payments. As I said, you know, we'll, we'll get two points, roughly two points of revenue growth from payments in the year. And, and remember, we're capped through July on what we can what we can do in the U.S. and we're and we'll quickly get to that cap in Germany here in the in the first and second quarter. So the majority of that two points of revenue growth is going to be coming in the second half. And then with you know, and in GMV as well, you'll have the combined impact of the conversion improvements and, and initiatives we're working on. That some of the things that Scott mentioned, in addition to, you know, a, a point of improvement half over half just from from lapping out of IST. Thanks, Ross. Your next question comes from Stephen Jew of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Scott, I uh, just wanted to understand how you're thinking on payments maybe evolving uh, now that you have another quarter of ops under your uh, in the rear view. So, I think in the past, uh, you guys had articulated a, a hard fork scenario when the contract comes off to, I guess, now more of a gradual transition. So has that thinking changed in terms of the speed at which you're willing to go, um, especially now that you're running up against the guardrails in terms of what you can do? Second, um, any you know directional commentary you can offer about what percent of your sellers have bought into using uh, promoted listings? and what that buy-in percent may look like in the newer markets in the West versus some of the, I guess, the older markets like Korea where this has been live for some time now. Thanks. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on payments. First, I, I don't, I, I view our payments evolution as going right on track right now. And the, uh, the, the gradualness is only in the near term in, in the sense that we're guardrailed with what we can do between now and July. Uh, once we're independent of the uh, the operating agreement with PayPal, we will go hard at, at at not only the two markets that we're in and expand the number of sellers and the GMV that's covered in the ecosystem uh, in both U.S. and Germany, but we'll expand it under the markets and other corridors. And so um, we're on track, if not uh, better than we thought, as we look towards the second half of the year. Uh, with regards to promoted listings, um, Maybe I'll, I'll let Andy, if he has any numbers, weigh in on that. But on the on the promoted listings within the U.S., I mean, what you see, oh, sorry, within the market, on-platform marketplaces business is roughly 30% of listings are actually getting some form of promoted listings utilization. And uh, as we look forward, uh, we'll learn from our Korea business, which has a much higher percentage but a completely different take rate. And so, you know, what we've said over time is that as we scale promoted listings and modify how we think about not only the user experience, but also the monetization of those assets to make sure that um, it's a valuable thing for sellers and uh, they view it as marketing expense versus just a take rate and, and a requirement. And you can, you'll, you know, I would expect us to continue to iterate that as we move forward within the plans that we've laid out. And, and in terms of number of sellers or percentage of sellers, um, you know, through the year, we grew the number of sellers promoting items by over 80%. We exited the year um, that was more, more than 1.1 million sellers. 
and represents more than $320 million listings in Q4. $320 million. $320 million, sorry. Thank Thanks, Stephen. Your next question comes from Edward Aruma of KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, good evening. Thanks for taking the question. I guess first on payments, um, are you noticing any change in conversion on when a seller is using payments and whether they're seeing any negative impact from, from switching over? And then second, uh, maybe this is a follow-up to one of the earlier questions. You know, Scott, you had talked about really embracing authentically eBay, and I guess just trying to think about some of the, the verticals that you've been very successful at historically. Any sense that you'll be able to kind of restart uh, maybe a more favorable growth dynamic in those verticals uh, uh, through greater focus? Thank you. Yeah, so on payments conversion impact, no, it's not down. I think that's just sort of a, a simple answer. Um, what you do see with payments is different user behavior, as you would imagine. Buyers have now have more alternatives, and sellers got, have a series of tools from which how to manage uh, their payments and connect their payments with their, um, with their listing activity, which makes it easier for them. And so I, I think on both sides of the equation, uh, this is a net positive, and certainly the, the conversion is fine. On authentically eBay, look, uh, the way I, I alluded to it last time and, and, you know, what I would point you to in the script from today and the points that I made is as we think about uh, not only how we've prioritized the product plans uh, for 2020, but also as we think about which verticals that we experiment in. And again, this is based on leveraging the structured data work that we've done, the aspects that we've expanded upon recently, and as we look towards uh, 2020 and beyond, you know, really indexing higher on verticals that, um, you know, that are, you know, more authentically eBay that people think of. And, and as much as it's that, it's about also the inventory that they think of us in. You know, when we talk about uh, vintage, collectibles, uh, interesting items, et cetera, people think of us. And we just have to be um, more relevant, uh, not only in how we show up on our search results, but how uh, that inventory is searchable and findable on the site in a way that doesn't uh, undermine uh, new buyers coming into the ecosystem, as we talked about a lot last year and prior, and then uh, most importantly, over time, also indexing on brands. So um, more to come on that as we move forward, but for right now, I think, that's, uh, I think Pete and the team have done an excellent job over the course of the planning horizon and setting us up for a 20 plan that is uh, very clearly uh, focused on vertical categories along with Jordan and, and the other regional country leaders uh, to really focus on uh, where we think we can win. Great. Thanks so much. Your next question comes from Dan Salmon of BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Um, maybe just a quick follow-up on the display advertising headwinds and classifieds. If you could just expand on that a little bit, Scott, and maybe in particular why you're not seeing it in Germany. Uh, and then second, uh, just thanks for the update as well on the, the CEO search. I, I may have missed it, but I, I don't think you put a timeline on that one, but just curious to see how you think about uh, how we might expect that to play out while the strategic review continues as well. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, on the CEO search timeline, we didn't lay out a uh, plan or, or a timeline, but just to, to reemphasize, the board uh, and, and a committee, subcommittee of the board is working very actively to, uh, to find a, a, to an, an interview and, and find the, the best possible candidate. Um, with regards to headwinds and classifieds, I, I think it's, it's important to note that there's a combination of factors going on, particularly in our horizontal platform businesses. And each one has it just to a, a different degree. Um, in particular, display ads are, are impacted by, A, what Andy called out, which is the, the shift to mobile devices. And that's been happening over time. And it's continuing and in some countries accelerating. And the second is kind of the downstream impact of a lot of the changes uh, within the privacy laws as well as what Google's done. And, and that limits to some extent uh, both the market of display ads and the effectiveness as well as then uh, what, what's showing up on our site. And I think that's pretty consistent across other players in the industry. That said, you know, look, as we head towards 2020 and beyond, I think uh, that'll normalize. And, uh, and, and I think the teams have done an excellent job, you know, as Andy called out, particularly in Klein and Zeigen, uh, as well as our automotive verticals to, uh, to continue to expand and grow. And so I don't, I don't see this as a structural long-term concern. It's just more of something that we've got to work through 
not dissimilar the, to the internet sales tax. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Your next question comes from Brian Fitzgerald of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks, guys. Maybe related to uh, Stephen's question, uh, second question, but asked a little differently. With, with promoted listings, revenue up 32% sequentially, but actual number of promoted listings, I think, was was less than 10% growth there. Can you can you walk us through what's the the strongest driver there? Is it is it higher bids? Is it improved conversions? And how much runway for for pricings uh, and conversions uh, can we see there going forward? Thanks. Yeah, Brian, uh, it's it's a great question. I think you answered it. Uh, it's a combination of conversion. I mentioned that in my script, and Andy alluded to it as well, that uh, a, a number of things that we've been doing in the ecosystem uh, under the underlying structured data improvements and aspects that we've been collecting has given us a capability to then serve those ads up with more certainty about what people are looking for and what might fit on that page to improve conversion. The other side of it, uh, then obviously prices uh, fluctuate and have, been, has, have gotten a little bit better. And then I think finally, uh, you're going to see us continue to look at where and how we place these, uh, these ads to make sure that they're accretive to the user experience. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, Scott. Yep. Your next question comes from Justin Post of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, great. A couple questions. First, on, on international, it's decelerated. Obviously, sales taxes aren't an issue. Um, are there any countries that you'd call out that are doing better or worse? And what are your big product initiatives to maybe help with the users and the growth there that you'd call out for international markets? And the second question is, is obviously you believe eBay stocks a good value here, been aggressive with buybacks and uh, helping grow earnings. Is, is core eBay at all part of the strategic review? Are you looking at some of your options there? Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Hey, internationally, I think the, the, the two countries to call out are, are the UK and Korea uh, for uh, different reasons. The UK is, is primarily macroeconomic. We've been tracking our performance relatively well with what's happening on a market basis, uh, and just the uncertainty around Brexit has, has put pressure on the growth rates uh, in the UK. And then Korea, as we've mentioned for several quarters, though it's been stable um, over the last quarter, but the continued pressure from from lower lower margin, and, you know, it's a, a tougher competitive couponing environment in Korea. Um, yeah, I mean, as we look at uh, helping international, um, I, I think you got to pivot to uh, on and off platform. And if you look at off platform, uh, first off, Japan and, and Turkey continue to grow really well. Uh, Korea, as, as Annie mentioned, is relatively stable in a very tough macro uh, situation and, and keeping in mind that they actually make money um, in, in that market, whereas uh, I don't think anyone else does. And they're doing that team is doing a fantastic job of iterating on how to deliver growth in a, in a market that, that has those dynamics. And I, I'd call out two things for them. Um, one may be more applicable to the rest of the platform, which is loyalty programs. They've done an excellent job with Smile Club and other parts of uh, the loyalty program to, to really capture over 2 million Koreans at this point that are part of our uh, paid loyalty program that bring great inventory, a, a wonderful payment support, payments capability with, with credit included, uh, and uh, first-party inventory listings uh, and, and a kind of capability to bring great value there as well as a, uh, a very uh, retail-centric first-party set of inventory that's offered on the platform. And that's a, a bigger and bigger part of that part of the business uh, every, every month. That team's done an excellent job. And so while they may not be growing at the same rate as some of the others that lose a billion dollars a year, uh, they're doing an excellent job at managing, at managing and driving a profitable growth, um, even if it's uh, lower than the overall. And if you look at the, if you look at the, the, the on-platform businesses, it, you know, there's a combination by market. We've talked about German Plot, DE Plus, where we've got a loyalty program there, and we certainly learned and have incorporated aspects from Korea into the German platform. We have the same in the U.K. and the same in the U.S., and we continue to iterate around those. But uh, I wouldn't point to any one, uh, one per se, uh, other than maybe in the U.K., and, and we alluded to this in the past, but... What you'll see in 2020 is a very unique uh, integration with Royal Mail that's going to allow tracking, which doesn't happen today, 
um, on Royal Mail. It's going it's to allow tracking on eBay. That will be uh, unique to eBay. And so uh, consumers in the U.K. will be able to see where their packages are and improve, uh, and improve their trust and confidence in receiving and when they're going to receive their item. But uh, there's a lot of different ones by country, but generally speaking, the larger platform, on-platform dynamics that I talked about will apply to, to most of those countries uh, across the board. And then on the... Great. And the go ahead. Yeah, so look, we, we do feel like this, you know, the stock is a good buy, which is why we continue to be aggressive uh, with the buyback. And in terms of core eBay being part of the review, it's, you know, Everything's part of the review. The way we approach it is exactly as we've talked to you about, which is we're disciplined in, in how we look at it, and we continue to iterate with the board. So uh, I wouldn't call anything specific out at this point, but uh, we, we look at everything. Great. Thank hey, you. Operator, we for, uh, for one more. Certainly. Your last question will be from Brian Nowak of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Great. Thanks for taking my question. I have, I have two. Just the, the first one on 2020 GMV, I think you talked about how you're going to have the IST challenges offset by, by higher conversion. Maybe talk to us about some of the, the qualitative changes or the product improvements that you see driving that higher conversion throughout 2020. And then back to the 4Q flat buyer number, you, you mentioned how there was some higher churn than expected. You just sort of talk to us about what, you know, what you saw in the consumers that were churning? Was it an inventory issue? Was it payment friction? So what, what did you observe that was causing that higher churn, and how do you fix that going into 2020? Thanks. I'll start with the, with the buyer number, Brian. Um, it's actually up 2% year on year. So just, just to be clear, it's 183 million buyers. The churn, you know, I don't think it's anything special in Q4. It's, it's more a continuation of, of what we saw in Q3. And it's really following the the increase in marketing we spent, the the mark the buyer driven marketing spend that we had in the second half of last year, first half of this year, where we attempted to reactivate buyers and attract new buyers. And what we saw with those cohorts is um, visited less frequently, spent less, and and were churning out at a higher rate. And that became the you know the the CLV and the value of those buyers started to to not not be worth the marketing dollars we spent on them. So that's why we've been pivoting away from that towards retention and, and focused on some, some higher value buyers. Yeah, with, uh, with 2020 GMV, the internet sales tax headwinds, I, really what you see is particularly at high, uh, higher ASP items, especially in electronics categories, that um, when people encounter at checkout sales tax, they bounce away. And the good news in that is that uh, they are at least coming back, and we're not losing them other than that transaction. And so what you see is there's a, there's a chunk of GMV that's, uh, that's, that's not uh, returning, but it's not getting worse uh, in, the, in the states that we've seen so far. And so I don't really see uh, the dynamics there uh, changing. And in the underlying conversion, we've had some minor benefits, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't point to one thing above all the others. I think, you know, in a marketplace, in an ecosystem like ours, it's, conti it's, imp it's, Im it's imperative to be working on the seller experience and making seller tools and seller dynamics better, as well as the buy side. And, and I think, broadly speaking, uh, some of the efforts that we did in 2019 as we look at conversion proof and as we look towards 2020 will improve. We're not pointing to one thing, but it's a, it's a series of things to try and improve the overall ecosystem. Thanks for the question, Brian. This concludes the allotted time for questions. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.